condition is high just for test theoretical reasons. The positive predictive value of any given test is will be high. And in rare diseases, if the prevalence of any given disease is low, of any given disease condition is low, then the positive predictive value will be low. Just for of any given test will be low just for test theoretic reasons. And the second point of this wonderful picture is that zebras are unique. You all are unique and there are several patients, persons in this room with a, with a new, not yet identified mutation. So you all are unique. And this is where things definitely begin to become difficult. If you do research, if you do clinical research, you can do it in different ways. One way is to go in one special case in a very depth in order to identify the final mutation you have. And that's the way Frank Lemanon does it. But if you want to, to make a research about how on drug efficiency, when you want to know if a special a given drug works in a given condition, you need randomized controlled trials. And then for evidence-based medicine. And in randomized controlled trials, you have to carefully define your inclusion criteria. You have to carefully to decide which is inside, which condition is inside of your diagnostic box. So the condition must met criteria one, two, three, and so on. So you are very well aware of the conditions inside the diagnostic box but you do not know which condition is outside of your diagnostic box. And this is a particular problem of unique rare diseases. And if you practice in medicine, we have learned that yesterday, if you are practicing medicine, it's not enough to go through guidelines and to go, go to algorithms. We have to learn to treat the patients empirically. That's really important, and that's, the, that's basically the art of medicine, to learn how to treat patients empirically. Um, that's a big point. And the other big point is we have to be modest and moderate and humble in our expectations, which we, what we can do for the patient and which conditions we can change. There are a lot of things we simply cannot change. That's the simple truth. And so we have, we, have, we have to learn to be moderate, humble, and modest. And in the field of pain medicine, one of the famous neurologists and pain and headaches, Peter Gosby, put it once this way. He said, I'm a neurologist, my patients do not die. I help them to manage life. And that's exactly the point, what we have to do in chronic diseases. So, now we start with anesthesiology. Another general remark, you all know that physicians are often not familiar with periodic paralysis. And so it's your task as a patient, as a, I'm personally convinced of that, it's your task or the patient as a patient to be better informed about your condition than the treating physician is. This is very essential for you as a patient with a chronic rare disease. And with anesthesiology, the problem might be that anesthesiologists are not specially trained in diseases. They are trained in procedures. They are trained how to do anesthesiology, how to perform anesthesia. And that is a completely different way of thinking. And if you have a particular care for neurologists, uh, anesthesiologists, if you tell him, well, I have periodic paralysis, please take care, you have to of this and that. And if you go with the literature, it's really difficult to get adequate evidence for how to do anesthesia in periodic paralysis. Here you see a recent review published in Muscle and Nerve in September, it's very recently, very recent, and here in this review of neuromuscular diseases, PP is not even mentioned. 
So it's rather difficult for the anesthesiologist to get the right information. Now um, I come to the essentials and I, as I um, began with them, as I said in the beginning, the essentials are very well known to you. One very, um, one very important thing is that you should avoid depolarizing muscle relaxing. And this is succinctanium. And this is not such a problem anymore as it was in the past because there are enough alternatives. And succinctanium is the only depolarizing muscle relaxant which is still in use. And it needs to muscle fiber depolarization and then and that is bad because it causes weakness because it inactivates the sodium channels. So, and especially in hyper PP and in PC, and of course we all know that stress and uh, can cause hyperkalemia. So stress has to be avoided. Perioperative stress has to be avoided. And of course we all know that low body temperature causes Blessed muscle weakness, and of course, we all know that that has to be avoided. This is a picture of Frank Lemon for muscle bundle preparation. If you uh, on an, if you on an excised muscle bundle, at first you get a very strong contraction, and then you get a weakness. And this is what you do not want to have. You want muscle. You want a relic so this, the main method is avoid depolarizing muscle relaxants, avoid succinctonium, which is not the problem anymore. If we start with anesthesiology, the first thing is, do we really need surgery? Urologists are conservative doctors, they do not perform surgery, and we say no surgery is best surgery. So the first thing is, do I really need surgery in this case? Is there any means to avoid that procedure? Next thing is you need a thorough pre, pre anesthesia, pre surgery examination with a full exam to make clear what is your status at, the, at this beginning before the um, surgery starts. You need a full exam, you need an electrocardiogram. And if there have been respiratory problems in the past or signs of infection, you need a chest X-ray. For uh, evident reasons, we um, are we recommend to do echocardiography and pulmonary function tests if there is any evidence in your personal history for problems with that. But these things: ECG, thorax, chest X-ray, echocardiography, and pulmonary function tests are. Or family and family are almost regularly done before major surgery. And it's very useful to have arterial blood gas analysis, not only to check respiratory function, but also to check the electrolyte. It's mandatory, of course, to have the, uh, the exact concentration of the electrolyte of sodium, potassium, and so on before you start the procedure. What about pre-medication? A pre-medication is a medication you get one day before the uh, procedure to make you calm, to make you have a good sleep. Usually, benzodiazepines are used, and that is usually possible. Uh, there are some exceptions. I'm well aware of the fact that many of you are, are very unique and not part of that. What I'm saying implies may be applied to all of you. But benzodiazepines are usually are beneficial, and they take away the stress, and they make a smooth relaxation. Of course, you should avoid a huge amount of sodium intake, so do not use um, sodium chloride um, solution in larger amounts, and of course, no pure carbohydrates, no pure glucose infusion. Um, statins is a special point. We have yesterday heard that there are some genetic um, conditions that 
cause disorders of muscle metabolism in statins, if you give statins, but completely independent of this thing, please consider that statins can lower sodium perchloride conductance of the sarcolem of the muscle fiber membrane in the same extent I think we found it fine bit in sodium channel myotonia. So it would be wise to stop statins before a um, anesthetic procedure because they can increase muscle fiber excitability and this is not the thing what we want to have in during surgery. Beta blockers are my personal experience very well to reduce perioperative stress and um, we recommend them regularly, but they're often not necessary, of course. During the surgical procedures, um, regular blood gas analysis, including electrolytes, is very useful. And of course, temperature monitoring is essential. We have to do any, everything to avoid hypothermia. In the past, some complications have been introduced by inhalational uh, anesthesiology agents, and this is at least um, um, where I come from now, old-fashioned anesthesiology uses regularly, not only in periodic paralysis, but regularly short-acting intravenous drugs like propofol and opioids with a short half-time, and these are very, very well suited for PP. You can use them without the fear to have a to introduce it to, to make a complication. And of course, I can, can't repeat it enough, no depolarization uh, muscle relaxants. Um, shivering uh, is a, after anesthesia may be a problem, so clonidine and nephropalm can be used for that, and it's very useful to have a, as a backup intensive care unit treatment available depends on the single case after surgery. Now I come to the complication of the neuro in the narrower sense, but the good method is that real anesthesiology complications in periodic paralysis are rare. The main complication, if you want to call it a complication, is that periodic paralysis can introduce an attack, but another complication in the narrower sense does not occur very often. One well-known complication in neuromuscular disorders is rhabdomyolysis. This means a breakdown of the muscle fiber integrity. The muscle fiber just starts, starts working and you have a high CK and so on. And this is a problem if you have a disturbed muscle fiber metabolism or if you have a denervated muscle fiber. And this is both not the case in periodic paralysis. In periodic paralysis, the muscle fiber is dysfunctional, but it's not innovated. So, rhabdomyolysis is usually not a special problem. Cardiac problems. Cardiac problems are not a special complication. Of course, in ATS, that's a different thing, because ATS has the long QT syndrome, long QT syndrome number seven, that's a special thing. And of course, if you have a really severe hypokalemia, you can come into a cardiac trouble because of severe hypokalemia. But this is not a problem of periodic paralysis per se. Respiratory distress, same thing. It's usually not a special problem because, as we all know, involvement of the respiratory muscles is rare. But of as we have heard yesterday, there are exceptions from that rule. And the thing is not so to treat respiratory problems, that's easy for an anesthesiologist, you know how to do and does that, but the problem is to recognize them in, at an appropriate time. Um, myotonic reactions can be a problem. They can be, especially in, in those cases of PP where we have myotonic reaction, that is an hyper-PP, we can induce them by potassium, of course, and by depolarizing agents, as I have pointed it out. So, myotonia, <laughs> there are a lot of complications with this drug, so avoid that myotonia of the, of 
the jaw of the masseter muscle, which is a, can be very high during the intubation, of course, is bad. It should be avoided. And if you have myotonia, myotonia can be aggravated by anything, by alterations of seroasmality, of the pH, of ambient temperature, and so on. So the anesthesiologist has to know that you have myotonic reactions and you should keep all this constant in order to avoid the development of a severe myotonic reaction. It can be treated by lidocaine or by mexlatine, as you all know. Um, not only myotonic reactions might be a, a problem in myotonia, but also masseter spasms or muscle spasm. Muscle spasm means means an uncontrolled contraction or a calcium problem, not a problem of the muscle fiber membrane. And this is due to increased sarcoplasmic um, calcium release, and that's a problem, a differential diagnostic problem, because this could resemble a, a malignant hypothermia. A malignant hypothermia itself is not an increased risk in periodic paralysis. It can be treated by dentrolane as well. And hypothermia, of course, should be avoided. It's usually not a problem in periodic paralysis. Maybe in some um, rare cases of hyperptipi. The much, as you all know, the much more grave problem is hypothermia because of the same that I've pointed here out. It increases the sensitivity of the muscles to the vaporizing to the muscle running sense. It can aggravate rhabdomyolysis and so on. So everything must be done to avoid hypothermia. So we come to the final and conclusion slide. What do we do in hypo-BP? We use a warm operation room. We should cap the area of operation warm with solutions. Of course, potassium should be kept in the normal range. We should avoid the sodium chloride or glucose infusions, and we should, whatever possible, we should do anything to avoid operation stress. And in yeah, um, some point, point to our local anesthesiology, we have learned yesterday we have a lot, we have some patients in periodic paralysis who are looking insensitive. Here, I want to make the point as we should give um, local anesthesia, the um, should, should be preferred to general anesthesia whenever it is possible, but we should not use epinephrine local anesthesia. It's usually used for keeping the anesthetic localized because this is a very good trigger of attacks. What to do in hyper-PP, just the other way around, also here, warm operation room, we have to be aware of the effect that after recovery from anesthesia, the patient may be paralyzed, and we have to be aware of the fact that depolarizing agents can precipitate a melatonic reaction. We, the anesthesiologist, should modify the induction sequence. This means he should not use inhalational uh, narcotic drugs, but short-acting intravenous narcotic drugs, and of course, he should avoid uh, muscle relaxants, especially. So, the essentials in high PP keep the patient warm, as you know, keep serum potassium at a high level, and avoid hyperglycemia. And um, on the other hand, in high PP, main such a sign the other way around, maintain a normal body temperature and keep serum potassium at a low level, and avoid hyperglycemia, of course. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. So, uh, are there any questions about um, anesthesia? I'm sure there's a bunch. Uh, I feel bad because the Q&A, the, the webinar people are, are going to struggle a little bit with that, but you know, what can we do? Uh, before we start with questions, by the way, Frank, do you think that we would be able to 
or that you would be able to, or I'm happy to collaborate uh, to make a, a paper, a peer-reviewed journal article, kind of writing these recommendations, because I think that's going to be really good for surgeons and anesthetists to be able to pull this paper and say A, B, C. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my question is, what about alternatives to general anesthetics? For example, a spinal, uh, any concerns with that, epidurals or regional blocks? No, no. Great, great question. I mean, no, 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 we should stay by the computer so they can hear your, your answer. Uh, the question is, uh, are there alternatives to general anesthesia, like local anesthesia or spinal blocks? That is what I meant with regional anesthesia. Regional anesthesia should be preferred to general anesthesia whenever it is possible. But, but also I have seen patients, even after regional anesthesia, in which regional anesthesia can introduce a paralytic attack, but usually no complication in the narrower sense of the word. Coming over there. What would you suggest uh, for, if you were going to be put out for, say, a kidney transplant, what would you suggest you, what sort of anesthetic should be used? So the question is, uh, if you're going to be uh, uh, put, put under anesthesia for a kidney transplant, what anesthesia would you use? Kidney transplant is, is excellent, rather major surgery, and uh, so uh, I would, as I have said, use short-acting intravenous drugs. You can give them as long as, the, as you need them, and, and opioids. As I said, that's the thing I would prefer. I should have brought my sneakers. Good morning. Um, my question is regarding being positive for hypokalemia and having a peanut allergy. And having, you know, if you go into anaphylactic shock, you have to give shots of epinephrine. What do you do? <coughs> so the question is, uh, what do you do if you have uh, severe allergies, like a peanut allergy, and you need to take an EpiPen, but you're a hypo-PP patient. Well, um, we say um, at home that's how to um, move through Skiller and Charybdis because you have a, a beast on either side out of the way, and you should treat that what is more dangerous. And as far as I know, we could ask dermatologists or allergologists in this case, a severe allergy is an acute life-threatening condition. And so you have to treat the acute life-threatening condition. And if you experience a paralysis in treating that, you have to take that into account, I would say. Absolutely. I mean, first things first, keep your breathing alive. And, same, and this goes for an asthma attack. If you, have, if you need to take a beta agonist and that's going to throw you to an attack because you, you take your uh, albuterol, but you have to breathe before and you'll be paralyzed. And that's fine. Okay. Oh. Shorter walk, guys. So I'll be ready. What are your suggestions for uh, moderate sedation? So if you have a bone biopsy or angiogram or said and of those fentanyl, uh, that kind of stuff. So the question is, if you need moderate sedation for a, a minor procedure like a colonoscopy, uh, what's your opinion on Versed and fentanyl? I would, for the nation, I would use short-acting benzodiazepines, or lorazepam, and very, very large reporting range on fentanyl for against analgesia as well. That's good. So, so these are these are reasonable alternatives, I guess. Hi. Regarding the EpiPen question, um, I've had to take six EpiPen injections already this year, and what I do is I dose with uh, 
uh, dialogues at the same time as they are using the other panel. Okay, I'm going to answer that one. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that after. Um, I, I want to ask about a, another issue that people have brought up, uh, not about weakness after surgery, but about uh, uh, a long time taking much longer than other people uh, to regain consciousness. Uh, do you, I, I don't have any understanding of what that is, and I, I wondered if you had anything to add. Okay, so the, the first comment was uh, someone who has to take an EpiPen, they take Diamox at the same time as the EpiPen, and then uh, that helps uh, that person. Uh, and the next question was uh, from Dr. Siegel, if, uh, does, does Dr. Weber have any experience with uh, someone, periodic paralysis patients, taking a much longer time to recover once the surgery is over uh, from the anesthesia? Well, to the last question, I'm afraid not. I have seen patients with long abortive attacks after surgery, abortive attacks of muscular weakness, which can last months or even weeks to recover, but I've never seen a patient with PP who has a delayed recovery concerning consciousness after anesthesia. Is that, is that answer your question, Vicky? I had that problem, that's why we were asking. Oh, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I, that question came up because a lot of the people in the room basically have the same, I think you were saying, and various people in the room have been saying that, or for me personally, I'm only 145 pounds, it takes a lot of anesthesia just to put me out, and then it takes a very long time to come out of the anesthesia to the point where every time I've had a surgery and I come out, my very first thing that I see is anesthesiologist and nurse just screaming at me trying to figure out why I'm not waking up. <laughs> so it's, it's a concern. I, I've never had any other major side effects, but that's one thing that's um, made me very curious about what might be causing that. Thank you for that. I did have a spinal done, and that put me into an episode. Um, I, it caused a lot of pain for me, and that triggered um, IPMC. That triggered the disorder, and that also then affects my breathing. So the, with PMC, there was uh, with spinal anesthesia, it triggered an attack, and also from the pain. I'm wondering if the if somebody's going to have adverse effects to general anesthesia, if it if it happens always immediately, or if sometimes it can happen um, a day or two after surgery. Can adverse effects from anesthesia happen always just immediately, or can you see it sometimes two to uh, one or two or three days after the surgery? Other effects should happen during or shortly after surgery from anesthesiology drugs. It depends on the drug you use. If you have an old inhalational drug, they have a kind of compartmentalization inside the body. They go into the, in the fat tissue and to the brain, and so can they can redistribute into the brain after being in the fat tissue. But this is a, an old problem. I think you do not have that with this new short-acting intravenous drugs anymore. And concerning your question, I would be interested in the kind of anesthesia you had. I, we sometimes have a problem in medicine, not in, especially in PP, that patients awake too late or they have a different kind of liver metabolism for this. And we know there are very different uh, genetic phenotypes concerning liver metabolism who degrade all the um, anesthesiology drugs. This is a P450 um, poly polymorphism. And I think this is, I, I would suggest that this is a problem and not PP as such. But I don't know. 
Yeah, so that basically different people's liver metabolize things differently depending on the genetics of the liver that's not necessarily related to, related to periodic paralysis. I'll, I'll get there. Fifteen years ago I had a general anesthesia. It was not the first time for general. And I was, uh, had succinylcholine. Following it, I had a CPK of 2,600. Would that be something, as you did in your talk, called rhabdomyolysis? Rhabdomyolysis. Yeah. Rhabdomyolysis. Is that that's the question? Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, one, one, one person says she had succinylcholine in surgery, and then subsequently her CPK was like 2,000. Is that rhabdomyolysis? Yeah, it could be. But uh, to be honest, a really small version of rhabdomyolysis. In rhabdomyolysis, you usually have 40,000, 50,000 or so. But succinylcholine should be avoided. That's pretty clear. What you were... I was just wondering what you would do. I have a bleeding disorder, and the medicine that they have to give me when I have anesthesia, when I have surgery, um, is sodium holding. So when I have surgery, I actually gain 15 pounds during the surgery, and I never have the reaction until after I go home after the surgery, and then like the next day is when my potassium drops so drastically like down 2.2, 2.3, and I go like completely paralyzed. I can't open my eyes, I can't move my head, I can't do anything. What do you suggest for me to do? Ignore the bleeding disorder? Or do I take the medicine, they have to do IV with it? Is there some kind of special IV that I should have them do with it? to make it better so that this doesn't happen and it happens every single time like I just about die after every single time. Okay, in short, this person has a bleeding disorder. The medication for the bleeding disorder is high in sodium. Uh, but she needs to take that before surgery, and that uh, results in very severe episodes. What can she do? Can you please tell me what kind of medication do you need in order to treat your bleeding disorder? It's um, Cymate, or I have a DDA and a DDA or Okay. Okay, so you need a blood product to be given to you to, in order to have a, um, a functioning coagulation. That's, that's right? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess there is some kind of blood thing as a uh, well, well, like, 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 yeah, so, so DDAVP, uh, this is your time, and Grace, you're closer to this than me. Uh, if you have, I think, von Willebrand's deficiency and you give DDAVP, which is uh, like antidiuretic hormone, it um, makes it get out of the platelets into the blood so that it's more functional. So it kind of like recruits more of the factor because you have a, lo a low factor. But that, I guess, must have a, so a sodium counter ion in that medicine. So, uh, yeah. You're so it makes you retain more. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not aware with this special fact, but I, I, the only thing I, I could mention, if you can't avoid that, you to, to try to start to keep your potassium high. That means starting um, to, to, to take exodus of potassium before surgery, you know, as often and as much as you can. I'm not really convinced, um, sure what is this cut, what is this? Kind of medication that is. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. The, the other thing you can do, if you if you email the specifics to PPA, ask the experts. We can at our leisure look it up properly and answer better. Yeah. So so the medication is DDAVP, which is yeah. So it retains water. So basically, it's not retaining the sodium, but it's making the kidneys basically not excrete any water. So the water is getting uh, get retained in the body. That's why you 
gain all the weight. So the fluid restriction would tend to counteract that. But well, I guess what I would suggest is ask your dear the hematologist. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, say, look, I've got this problem. Whenever I take DDAVP, it causes an attack. Is there another option to improve my platelet function, um, or you know, platelet maybe even a platelet transfusion right before the surgery? Uh, Thank you, Jim. More questions. Uh, someone who hasn't gone. Um, question I have is what with um, hypo, what should we aim as this group to keep our potassium levels at? Okay, good question. I'm going to expound on that question. The normal level of potassium is normally 3.5 to 5. As a group in general for hypokalemic periodic paralysis, is there a potassium level above which we should try to stay? Well, it's uh, easy to answer, but difficult to obtain. Keep the potassium as high as possible, uh, as high as it is achievable in your special case. Um, uh, I, in my experience, they, you do not have to be anxious if you have a, a high PPP patient for high potassium levels, it becomes dangerous for the heart if you have a level of 7 or 8 or something like this. And this will never be achieved by oral potassium intake in high PPP patients. Great. I have a question about uh, temperature after surgery. I had about five or six surgeries during my life. And my temperature is always uh, rising, but not enough for them to help me. When I go home uh, for a local surgery, I have always to get a very cold shower and eating ice to put my temperature down. What, I, what can I do about it? So just to clarify, your your temperature after surgery is usually too high, and what can you do about it? Okay. As far as I've learned from yesterday, your condition is very unique. And I, I think if you have a, a heightened body temperature after surgery, this means you have an increased muscle fiber metabolism. You have an increased because all the heat we produce in the body is a byproduct of our physical work if the muscles are contracting. And if you have an increase in body temperature as a, being a muscle patient, I think you have by whatsoever an increased muscle metabolism. And this, of course, can be um, counteracted with drugs like Dantrolene or so. But if you are able to come back to normal body temperature with, let's say, easy physical means as you have described it, I would stick to that. I would do anything else. I wouldn't do anything. If I, can you comment uh, on the relationship between malignant hyperthermia and periodic paralysis? And is it really true that that doctors should have dantrolene on hand, or really they're they're really unrelated, and that shouldn't be a consideration. I, I think it's unrelated in in, in periodic paralysis and hyper and the, the risk of malignant hyperthermia is very low. But of course, dantrolene should be in in, in reaching distance if um, surgery is done in PP. Okay, and then Mickey, you, you had something. I don't know. Did I? Uh, you want to say? I was thinking of a question, but I don't believe I made a physical motion of it. But um, but my my understanding is that, that the SCN that some SCN four A mutations have been associated with with uh, malignant hyperthermia. Uh, we could look that up, but it is you know, the trouble with these mutations is you can mutate any of hundreds of different amino acids in different ways, and so. <coughs> Uh, well, if you have the exact same mutation as somebody else, you have the same, but otherwise it's sort of our guess as to how the, the protein is, 
is functioning. Question. If if a patient were to have an emergency wrist bracelet, what what uh, short list would you say you could put on there, such as no inhaled anesthetics, no succinylcholine, no sodium chloride for that EMS personnel? Or in, with this, in all, with this, in the, in the setting of myotonia, congenita, and PB. So the question is, uh, in the setting of myotonia congenita uh, and and or periodic paralysis, uh, is there a, a short list of, of medications that could be uh, listed on a, on a bracelet or a, a medical alert uh, tag? I think just as you described, this would be fine. To use short acting intravenous drugs. Hmm? So I guess the question is, do you do you put what you should use or do you put what you should avoid? Depends on how much room you have on the bracelet, right? But uh, maybe both, because what you should use is much easier for the doctors, you know, um, to do. More questions? There was a lot of questions. I'm sweating from running. Uh, okay, well, uh, let, let's take like a, let's take a five minute breather and then... And I'm very well aware of the fact that I know I'm going to describe the regular findings in chronic paralysis. I'm very well aware of the fact that there are some of you who are so unique, who have a so unique finding, so unique mutation that not all, everything of these things I'm going to explain now will apply for your special condition. We begin with the basics. You all know that we have inside our cells, inside our muscle cells, usually have a high potassium concentration and a low sodium concentration. And outside in the extracellular space, it is just the other way around. We have a high, I think it's Sarah, and we have a high sodium concentration and a low potassium concentration. And at rest, when we have the resting membrane potential, we have a high permeability for potassium, a high potassium conductance, and a low sodium contactance. And this concentration difference is being maintained by a membrane pump, which needs energy, that is a medicine, sodium potassium ATPase. This is, these are the things that you learn at medical school. And every student learns at medical school that the resting membrane potential of an ordinary muscle cell or of an ordinary neuron is about minus 90 millivolts. And this follows a special equation, Nernst's equation or Goldman's equation, everybody learns. And from this equation you can derive that if you increase the concentration of potassium in the extracellular level, you get a membrane depolarization. What you do not learn at medical school that we do not only have these, even at a normal muscle fiber membrane, we do not only have this resting membrane potential at about minus 90 millivolts, but we also have a considerably smaller amount of healthy muscle fibers, which are in our other state we call P2. And in this P2 state, about minus 60 millivolts, this the fraction, the proportion of the muscle fibers in the healthy muscle fiber in the healthy muscle is low. And even in healthy muscle fibers, you can increase this amount of fibers that is in the P2 state simply by lowering the extracellular potassium concentration. And this is the reason why you can drive every person, even a healthy person with healthy muscles, in a weakness state if you low serum potassium levels.
because you increase the P2 state. And you see here this um, um, findings of muscle contractions, muscle fiber that are in the P2 state, they cannot develop force. And that's the reason for weakness. Why is this the case? Why can muscle fibers that are in the P2 state not able to develop force? It's always a difficult interplay between sodium and potassium. And these are the things now every person learns at medical school. You need to, in order to, um, make, as a muscle needs, in order to make force, you need some muscle fiber action potential. And this muscle fiber action potential has to be generated. And for the generation of the muscle fiber action potential, you need a sodium influx by, provided by sodium channels which are able to open. And a muscle fiber sodium channel that has the ability to open must be on a special potential, usually at the so-called beginning from the so-called resting membrane potential. And this graph here gives, the de gives you the dependency between the availability of a muscle fibers and the membrane potential. And if you see, we have a, an ordinary case. Ordinarily, we have the P2 state. P2 state about minus 90 millivolts. We have nearly all of the sodium channels of the muscle fiber fibers are available, almost 90%. But if we are at the P2 state, at minus 60 millivolts, we only have about 20% of all our muscle fiber sodium channels available. And this is the reason why the fibers are weak, because we simply do not have enough sodium channels for enough sodium intake in order to get an action potential. And this interplay between P1 the P2 state, that is governed by potassium. We call it a bistable membrane. Bistable membranes, by the way, are not so unusual. You find bistable membranes in the central nervous system in neurons that have a periodic um, discharges like the neurons we have for breathing or something like that. This relation between the P1 state and the P2 state is governed by the external potassium concentration. We have heard yesterday that even in normal conditions, not all our sodium channels inactivate properly. This is the reason why we have a so-called physiological sodium leak. And even, and, and we have, for the sodium intake during the action potential, we have two driving forces. One driving force is a sodium potassium pump, and the other is the electrochemic driving force. And even, this are the green bars, even under physiologic conditions, under the physiologic condition of a so-called physiological sodium leak, if you lower the external concentration of potassium, you can increase the, muscle, the portion, proportion of the muscle fibers that are in the P2 state. And, and the mutations you, we know we have in periodic paralysis, they often have that so-called omega pore. The omega pore is just an extra pore, an extra hole in the muscle, mem in the, in the muscle channel which allows an additional amount of sodium to come in into the muscle. So you have an additional sodium intake into the muscle fiber. And this increases the proportion in interplay with, in interplay with the external potassium, increases the proportion of the muscle fiber that are in the P2 state. And muscle fibers in the P2 state are, as we have learned, weak. They cannot develop force. Um, so, um, these are now MRIs, you have seen them before. Yesterday, the normal muscle has a full muscle strength, 
and if you have a lot of attacks, you have an increased amount of sodium inside the cell, and inside the sodium ED accumulation and edema, this will cause, independent of the attack, additional but reversible weakness because the sodium potassium antiviral is working to get the sodium out of the muscle. But on the long run, if you have a experience many attacks, the amount of sodium inside the muscle and sodium should not be inside the muscle in a large amount increases and this leads by and large on the long run to a muscle fiber degeneration, to fibrosis and to fatty replacement of the muscle fibers and that's the reason for permanent weakness, especially in, in the size that is regularly experienced in persons with a high to PP, even or as also in high per PP. <coughs> so what we have to do is, on the, from a theoretical point of view, with our medications, is to keep the, um, 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 the, the largest amount possible of muscle fibers in this P1 resting state. Because if muscle fibers are in this P1 resting state, they can develop ordinary normal force. And if we allow the muscle fibers to get into this P2 state, they, are, they can be activated. This is reversible, but they can be activated they are weak. And on the long run, this leads to irreversible degeneration by ongoing sodium influx inside the muscle and this leads to vacuolar myopathy, as we have seen yesterday. So, our aim is to keep enough fibers into the P1 state. Um, this is a brief outline of, of the different effects of hyper-PP and hyper-PP mutations. On the left side of the slide is hyper-PP. You have uh, this additional pore, this apparent pore, that's the omega pore, and the red arrow uh, shows you the the sodium intake, and this is governed, as we have heard, by low serum potassium, by low potassium in the exocellular space, which leads um, then to sustained height, sustained depolarization, and to weakness into to the T2 state. The duration, the, the duration is slightly different in high PP, than where we usually have only the central pore, not the omega pore, but here we have a sodium channel mutation and the amount of sodium channels that do not inactivate properly is increased. So, if you have a relatively high potassium which leads to muscle fiber depolarization, the sodium channels activated, they lead to, to fiber depolarization, but they cannot inactivate anymore. And that's the reason because the weakness occurs in the hyper PP. Um, as we have learned more about the channel mutations in hyper PP that contain a omega pore, omega pore is the additional pore that leads to an additional influx of sodium. We have learned that there are mutations with large leaks, and we have learned that there are mutations with small leaks. Mutations with large leaks, they lead to a high intramuscular resting sodium. You have a high intramuscular sodium intake, and leading to, at the first time, reversible permanent weakness, and then irreversible weakness and fatty muscle replacement, as you have shown there. These patients with large, with large leak mutations have a, only a slow, uh, slight ictal hypokalemia and a less ictal sodium increase. And therapy, from the theoretical point of view, in these large leak mutations um, means just avoid um, an additional potassium outflow, potassium sparing, 
and there is sodium extruding diuretics. The other, other extreme of the mutations are the mutations who have, which have a small leak. Due to the small leak, you have a lower intramuscular resting sodium because less sodium can go into the muscle, but you have fewer attacks. But in the, during the attacks, you have a large sodium increase leading to fiber swelling, maybe to compartment syndrome. And the main thing in this mutation with the small leak is that you need, because you have a small leak, a more severe hypokalemia to, um, to bring your fibers in the P2 state. And this means that you might have a severe hypokalemia, so severe that it will cause a cardiac arrhythmia. So, what are we going to do? We need drugs that stabilize cells in the P1 state, as we have heard. These are the well-known diabox and diclofenamid, the endosome antagonists, maybe progesterone, and maybe uh, potassium ATP channel openers, if they were at our disposal. Um, this is mm, just for repetition. You all know that what evidence such as periodic paralysis um, everybody here in the, in the room knows what ought to use on that file. Um, mutation, of course, is a final proof, but we have learned several times about two thirds of all the patients with hyperbolic paralysis have a detected mutation, the other rest has a yet undetected mutation. These are um, less important features of periodic paralysis, especially the late age of onset, no exclusion criterion. We usually do not often provocative tests because they are dangerous and often negative. And we have heard that yesterday um, we do not do imperial paralysis muscle biopsy regularly because we have um, often unspecific alterations and we only do that to exclude other things. You know, better than I know, one of the triggers of weakness spells in hyper-PP is of course stress. Infection should be avoided. Vaccination, vaccination may lead to a release of inflammatory factors and they can be um, can be counteracted, suppressed by non steroid drugs. We have talked about, we have talked about surgery, we have talked about cold environments, and we have talked about hormones that trigger hyper-PP. You all know better than I know the beverages and the, and the, the, the food that can trigger weakness spells, and we all know that sodium salt should be avoided. These are the traps you have that on the website that can worsen hyper-PP. We have a, we already talked about statins, myotoxic and chloride conductants, and we also we talked about a muscle a drugs that cause muscle ischemia like epinephrine. That's another summary of what we have to prevent weakness spells. Continuous mild exercise is an important point to keep your muscles healthy as well as possible. Low sodium, low carb fiat diet, you all know that. So, in the acute stage, we use potassium, and these are the, the other medications we use for chronic, um, for chronic intake. Um, how does Potassium work is always the same. Potassium, high potassium shifts the amount, the proportion of muscle fiber that are in the P2 state to the P1 state and thus increases trends. Oral potassium ingestions, as you know, can cause stomach pain and maybe they can release uh, aldosterone 
and it can um, compete with other substances for intestinal absorption, so you have to check your vitamin levels regularly in chronic potassium intake. Thus, the aim should be from a theoretical point of view to raise your serum potassium by re reduce your excretion of potassium. And this can be done by aldosterone antagonists that raise the serum potassium by good excretion and we have the old substance, the spironolactone and I have some patients who still work well who enjoy taking spironolactone or as a new substance, the Inspra, which a lot of you take. We all know that it might be very difficult, especially in hyper-BP, to raise um, the potassium level to a really low, to a really high level. So there are some patients who need to take potassium in a very large amount, but um, you do not have to be anxious um, for hyperkalemia if you have healthy kidneys only in kidney insufficiency and oral potassium ingestion uh, will lead to a dangerous hyperkalemia. Um, the potassium sparing diuretics, they raise serum potassium by reduced excretion shifting fibers from P2 to T1. We use preemptorane. I have good experience with preemptorane, especially in low doses and amyloride. Amyloride uh, blocks an epithelial sodium channel as preemptorane does it. These are well known and, in my, in my opinion, effective drugs. Um, carbohydrate and other inhibitors, diamogs, they act on potassium channels shifting P2 fibers to P1 fibers. Daronite is a little bit more potent than um, diamogs is. Diamogs inside the muscles uh, increases the force uh, because it blocks the uh, Sarcoplasma reticulum calcium ATPase. You all know the side effects of this drug, nausea, dizziness, paresthesia, and maybe a strange taste. You can habituate these side effects and they can be overcome by a low increase of the dosage. Beta blockers, you have heard before, but I'm fond of beta blockers because. They take away the stress, they take away anxiety, and they indirectly inhibit aldosterone. And so non-selective beta blockers are a good thing that should be used more. And they are, of course, widely, widely accepted for the thyrotoxic subtype of hypopp, but they are not so often used in familiar hypopp. What we regularly do is we combine low-dose medications of different groups plus oral sodium intake to trying to keep the additional potassium intake as low as possible and trying to keep adverse effects minimal. You know that um, hypopp can be influenced by sexual hormones um, the break we had and we talked about that um, there are some patients reporting improvement during pregnancy or patients reporting improvement, long lasting improvement after hysterectomy and ovarectomy. Um, patients who have an improvement after um, during pregnancy, they can be helped by a progesterone only pill which has also an effect on muscle fiber excitability. Um, the individual prognosis, as you know, is, um, is absolutely determined by the mutation and we have this um, two ends of the spectrum. I already told to you the leaks which have a large sodium intake 
a lot of um, a lot of sodium intake, progressive weakness, mild hyperkalemia, and the links with a small sodium intake, severe hyperkalemia during the spells. Genetic background is important, and of course, environmental factors. Worry, strong physical work is not good for a weak muscle, but a moderate continuous exercise is good for the weak muscle. We all know that hypokalemia can cause muscle pain and arrhythmia, especially after exhausting physical exertion, resulting in muscle cramps and muscle ischemia. This should be avoided. Um, because we have so many now undetected um, mutations, there are always case reports of anecdotal success stories of medication that work in certain cases. And of course, we are looking for a drug that inhibits the additional, the additional omega-4 that would be a very, a very good drug against the hypo-BP. And these um, differential diagnoses like um, episodic ataxy, with the diseases, we talked about that yesterday. Finally, I would like to come to another, um, to another thing, to another issue. In the last years, we have um, faced the problem of patients with periodic paralysis plus sinus hyperplasia. These are patients who have, in addition to their periodic or episodic weakness, they have, in addition, exercise-induced weakness. And the question is, how do, what shall we do in this patient? And up to now, we have no sound scientific evidence for a caution role for thymus hyperplasia. But we favor thymus these cases. Why do we do that? We all know that a sinus hyperplasia in an adult is a certainly an abnormal finding. In an adult, usually the sinus should have gone. Point one. Point two is sinus hyperplasia is often associated with antibodies against the neuromuscular junction. If this is the case, we have my senior gravis which is a well-known, well-defined disease. But even in cases of mycenia gravis, you always have patients who have no antibodies, who are antibody negative. So we're antibody negative, mycenia gravis, which means antibody negative, exercise-induced weakness, is not such a rare finding. And we know from these patients, which antibody negative mycenia gravis, but they usually do improve after thymectomy. And it's obvious that antibodies against neuromuscular junction certainly will aggravate periodic paralysis. So, we usually favor thymectomy in this, if these conditions concur together. And here, a recent uh, publication from Frank Le Bonhomme of a Chinese patient with a hypo-PP which was complete and plus hyperplasia. And here in this case, the hyperpp was relieved by a moment. This concludes my presentation, and this is the view out of our window. Thank you very much. So, Frank, just following up on the thymic hyperplasia story, so um, w what would be the recommendation? Because, I mean, that would be asymptomatic. Uh, it's not going to cause any chest symptoms usually. So what would be the recommendation for patients with periodic paralysis? Should they have a chest X-ray or a CT scan to screen for this condition? Should patients with periodic paralysis routinely have a chest X-ray or CT scan, to uh, screen for thymic hyperplasia.
And in fact, we do that regularly, especially in those cases who have, in addition to episodic weakness, exercise-induced weakness. And then we'll test whether they are mastinone sensitive. And if they are mastinone sensitive, we'll, we'll do a CT scan and of the chest. And usually we see a something, a rest of thymus tissue, a thymus hyperplasia, and then we uh, talk to the patient whether we should remove it, and we have removed it in certain cases, usually with success, but not usually with, let's say, incomplete success, because after thymus removal, the episodic weakness still is present, but it's, usually it's better than not, than before. So, and the type of anesthesia? And the same as I told you. G general anesthesia for removing the thymus. Uh, so so if, if someone has like just a, a, a routine sodium channel mutation, uh, do you have to search for thymus hyperplasia in, in, in a genetically confirmed patient or is it something that you'd recommend only for genetically ambiguous patients? Uh, I recommend it in, in patients who are clinically ambiguous. If they have episodic weakness plus something else, for example, episodic weakness plus exercise-induced weakness. These are two different things. And if they have exercise-induced weakness too, and they respond to mastinone, I do it. So, so one trigger for a very common trigger for periodic paralysis is rest after exercise. So then exercise is a trigger. Uh, but the person is genetically diagnosed with a sodium channel or a calcium channel mutation. Uh, do they need to screen for thymus hyperplasia? If they respond to mastinone, I do. If they increase their routine in between attacks muscular strength, if they're feeling better after mastinone, if breathing is better, swallowing is better, then I'll do that. So, so I'm just trying to get a handle on what, what should be like the routine thing. So that is to say, so uh, f for example, selfishly, I get um, you know attacks after exercise. Should I be having a mestinone uh, challenge in addition, or, or do I need not worry about that? As an example, yeah, as as we just pointed out, rest after exercise is just an ordinary trigger for hyperplasia attacks, but. If there is something new, if there comes something new kind of weakness in addition to that we have before, I'll do that. And it's rather easy to, to, to make a mastinone test, to give mastinone in a, in a middle dosage to see whether the condition improves. And it's well tolerated. And if the patient says, I improve, I'm feeling better, then I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Questions? So you mentioned the use of uh, potassium channel openers, and do you have any experience with and comments on, let's say, panacetone versus minoxidil or other other channel openers? Any experience with that? Any comments? Yeah. Just read, read. So do, do you have any experience with potassium channel openers and uh, do you favor one versus another, minoxidil versus panacetone? No, we have only n equals one. <laughs> um, we have only cases, single cases, where it works. But we just, I can give a general recommendation. The question is: uh, There's an adult patient, uh, adult uh, person here whose uh, thymus was present on MRI. And the question is: Is that normal or is that abnormal? Because it should have gone away theoretically in the adult. Uh, I have the opinion that any presence of thymus as an adult person is a non-normal finding. An ab is an abnormal finding. The thymus should have gone away in an adult person, period. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mickey, just, just, to, just to reiterate for the, the computer. So if you, the feeling is that since, since uh, malignant hyperthermia and periodic paralysis, when periodic paralysis occurs in the calcium channel, since malignant hyperthermia is a calcium channel mutation, and periodic paralysis can be a calcium channel mutation, uh, it's very important for calcium channel uh, mutation individuals to mention this to the anesthesiologist. Did I get that? Basically, okay. I agree with that comment.
The, the question is that your, your accent caught me, off, caught me off guard there. Um, so if you have periodic paralysis and uh, you want to have a kid, is there anything you can do proactively before, I guess, you conceive or however that goes down uh, to prevent passing on the periodic paralysis to offspring? Well, actually, I don't know. I think there is no means to do that. So, I, I don't know if, who, if people know about this stuff. I guess the technology appears to be there to do this for genetically diagnosed individuals, uh, and it depends on the, um, the, the country you're in, in terms of the regulations of, of, of what, what, is, what is done uh, in, in that country. Um, I mean, I guess in theory, right, when you have a sperm and an egg come together and you get to the state where you have like 16 cells, uh, then you can take one of those cells and, or two of those cells and they'll, they'll come back to, to the 16. And so those two cells you can now test uh, and, and you can even manipulate those c cells in theory by cutting out one gene and putting in a new gene. Uh, and that's kind of where gene therapy uh, may be going. Uh, but I'm certainly not an expert in that. That's just theoretical. The your the the because your your talk was was uh, interesting um, to put together the different things. So you have you basically have in hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Just for the sake of talking about that, uh, you have channels in two states. You have a P1 state where you can have a fiber membrane fiber membranes in two states, a P1 state where you have good strength and a P2 state where it's not particularly exciting. And uh, in the P2 state, you have, a, you have low potassium on the outside. And uh, so now, and, and, and that P2 state, well, so that P2 state is caused by two things, or low potassium on the outside, or because there are ab abnormal leaks on the sides of the sodium channels. So there's two main strategies for therapy in periodic paralysis. One is how do we get the potassium back up to a normal level in the blood? And there are a variety, in fact, all of the treatments that we do for hypokalemic periodic paralysis, in terms of why, why we know they work, it's to go by that strategy. But then there's this new mechanism that's proposed now that's saying, well, part of this, the reason that we're weak is because of this aberrant leak, so we need to plug that hole. So I think Steve Cannon's group, uh, the story with the Bumex, which is another diuretic, I don't know that it had to be a diuretic, it's just a molecule that happens to fit in that hole. It happened to be a diuretic. But uh, all these other molecules that we're hearing about uh, that anecdotally may have worked in periodic paralysis or, or other diseases, and, and we can't quite explain their mechanism of action, because like, why would minocycline, which is an antibiotic and anti-inflammatory, work in periodic paralysis? Maybe they happen to have the right structure to fit in one of these side leak holes. So uh, that becomes very interesting for uh, mouse models to screen a whole variety of small molecules to see what molecule fits and plugs these leaks. So uh, this is kind of opens up a whole new possibility for uh, experimenting with uh, new drugs with a real target in a real animal model, uh, and you can get a, a turnaround of results uh, reasonably quickly. So uh, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of new, um, new therapies coming out uh, down the pike in the next couple of years, uh, provided we uh, you know, continue down that path. Is that fair? So, 